Okay, go ahead and get started. I hope everybody's doing well. We've been getting a new roof and the guy finished today and he was real excited because right as he finished, it started raining. And so that was pretty cool. He was pretty fired up. Um, what I thought we would do first is go over the paper assignment because it's due in four days, I guess. And so <clears throat> in general, it's basically the same, follows the same grading rubric that we've used in the past. The two things or three things that matter are these questions. And those questions, um, what I would do is just write the paper in that order. And so when you describe in detail how protein is digested and absorbed in ruminants, start at the mouth, do the rumen or the reticular lumen, then the abomasum, the small intestine, large intestine, and do them in order and in as much detail as possible. And then what role does the supply of carbohydrates play in the utilization of protein? Uh, this is specific, specific. This right here is specific to the ruminant animal and what you really need to do or what you should talk about in relation to that is um, basically how carbohydrates provide energy to the ruminal microbes. So we're going to have a supply of energy and ruminal microbes need that energy to be able to synthesize proteins, to be able to grow, to be able to reproduce to be able to do microbial things. So grow and reproduce are the things we care most about, but they also have maintenance requirements and carbohydrates provide that energy and they use that energy to synthesize protein. And for every um, thousand grams of fermentable organic matter, we on average get 130 grams of microbial crude protein. Okay, and so Carbohydrates supply energy um, to the ruminal microbes so they can grow and produce um, microbial crude protein. On the flip side, you need to have a supply of DIP or degradable intake protein so the microbes can grow and create the enzymes to digest the carbohydrates. So you have to have both simultaneously. You have to have carbohydrates and you have to have protein degradable protein in particular, working together to allow the ruminant to most efficiently digest the food you're providing. If you don't have enough DIP, the animals will actually stop eating. And so they'll eat less and less and less carbohydrates because they can't digest them. And so that's actually what I did all of my eight years of graduate school working on is what happens if you don't have enough degradable intake protein. Okay. So that answers one's pretty easy, two and three. You need carbohydrates to provide energy and carbon skeletons. This is where they're gonna get the carbon skeletons for the synthesis of protein. How does carbohydrate digestion depend on protein? You use degradable intake protein and the amino acids the microbes produce to synthesize the enzymes that digest the carbohydrates. Before we go on, um, does anyone have any questions about that paper? Uh, Dr. Wickshire? Yes. Uh, can you repeat a number three again? Yes. So number three, how is carbohydrate digestion, digestion dependent on protein being available in the rumen? So for them to digest pro or for them to digest carbohydrates, the microbes, for the microbes to digest carbohydrates, you have to have um, microbial crude protein because the enzymes that digest the carbohydrates are made of protein and for the microbes to have those and for the microbes to be alive, they have to have protein. So the presence of protein or microbial synthesis of enzymes allows you to digest carbohydrates. The digestion of carbohydrates provides energy for additional synthesis of microbes and additional synthesis of enzymes so you can digest more carbohydrates. There, it's like a cycle. You provide more carbohydrates, you need to provide DIP. And so we could go back and think about when we talked about carbohydrates on the last test, one of the outcomes we saw 
with providing more non-structural carbohydrate was an increase in microbial crude protein. And the reason that happens is we provide more energy. And so when we provide more non-structural carbohydrate, we also have to provide more DIP. So the microbes have all of the tools they need to utilize the carbohydrates. Good? Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Okay, and so when you grade the papers, just keep those things in mind and um, be reasonable with each other. Okay, share this. Okay, this is the quiz. I don't know if we need to go over it because like everybody essentially almost got 100. And so if you guys wanna go over it, like, you know, say, someone say, yeah, I wanna go over it because. Yes, please. Okay. Can you explain the last question? All right, well, I'll just go through them all. So okay. um, we're not gonna do questions like number one again because that was a fail. And so that's why you guys could take it all again. Uh, I think Maddie asked about the last question. Was the last question question five? Or question? Whatever the answer was for. With what? Question. The one about how many, In a like perfect the maximum world? number of amino acids. Yeah, that one. Okay, so we'll do this one. In a perfect world without sodium leaking from the cell, what is the maximum number of amino acids that could be transported into the cell from one ATP? So what you have to know from this is for every ATP, we transport three sodiums out. So that means we can use three sodiums on the luminal side to transport things in. Okay, and so if we go back, I'll get an enterocyte out. I mean like music. Okay, if we have an enterocyte and we have three sodiums getting pumped out, um, that's at the expense of one ATP. That means we basically have three sodiums up here we can bring into the cell. Um, if we wanna maximize amino acid transport, we'd use the peptide transporter. And so we can transport three tripeptides in because when we, um, Use PEPT1, we bring in a proton, and then we pump out a proton, and that uses one sodium. So we could basically spin this three times, allowing us to bring in nine um, amino acids. They're brought in as three tripeptides, but they're gonna be broken down by peptidase into amino acids. So that's how I arrived at that. Um, basically, it was for you to think, and sometimes that works better than others, and so. It didn't work so well on this one. Okay, number, did that work for number four? Everybody good on number four? Yes. Okay, someone had their hand up, but their hand went away. Okay, I'll keep going. Question three, which transporters can transport individual amino acids against their concentration gradient? That's only Na plus with a big D, because that means it's, um, sodium dependent. If it was a little d, it would be independent. So everybody did well on that because you can do it a lot of times. Question two, potential active transport of glucose is reduced when which transporters for the products of protein digestion are active? The answer is A and C. The reason A, we just kind of went through um, with the With the peptide, we're using sodium. And with the sodium dependent transporter, we're using sodium. And so as a result of that, that's diminishing the sodium or the electrochemical gradient. So making it more difficult to transport glucose with SGLT1. 
Um, this is a real local event. Once you've absorbed some stuff, you can move further on and you can still continue to absorb other things. So it's not like you're actually going to run out of sodium to transport the nutrients you consume. It's just, again, something to kind of think about. Why we have an enterocyte up. Does anyone have any questions on the enterocyte? Okay. Everybody's good? Okay, we'll go back. Um, so this one in the small intestine, SI cells sense acidic digestive containing oligopeptides, causing these cells to release secretin and CCK respectively. Uh, one of the areas we got tripped up on this when I first posted it was you had to put them in order to get it right. That's what the respectively means. S cells secrete secretin and I cells secrete CCK. But if you typed them in in a different order, it would have been a problem. So I just let it be whatever it needed to be. You could write either one. And then secretin and CCK act on the enterocyte to release enteropeptidase into the small intestine, which activates trypsinogen into trypsin. And so something that's important in my mind is that you understand the sequence of events and can think about it and describe it. And then in addition, secretin and CCK cause the pancreas to release buffer to increase duodenal pH. So just really keep in mind that secretin and CCK uh, work together to increase protein digestion and raise the pH of the small intestine. Everybody good there? Yes, no? Okay. Uh, what I thought we would look at next is, you can see exam three down here, but it's not ready. Um, exam three activity. And I don't know, I'm assuming this is what it looks like when you guys see it. I don't know exactly what it looks like when you guys see it. So please read all the directions carefully. You will draw three copies of for non-ruminant. So basically you're gonna make three protein non-ruminants, three pigs or three horses, you can do either one, um, for the non-ruminant and they will be copies. They will be identical copies, do not photocopy them. Um, but redraw them three times, okay? And do that for both the non-ruminant and the ruminant. And you need to use the templates because the templates I gave you are stamped. And so what I mean by they're stamped, they're stamped down here. That way I know you just didn't use the ones from last semester or um, just the ones you made for class. Mainly I'm worried that you just got some from a friend. So that way you can't do that. I'm sure there's a way around it, but at least you have to work at it. Um, and then you have to do unique features, which is um, probably frustrating to some of you. Um, it would be frustrating to me as a student. But again, the reason you're doing that is so you can't just use someone else's drawings. You can't get together because you're supposed to be social distancing anyway. But you can't get together with a roommate and one of you draw the pig, one of you draw the horse or when you draw the cow and then put them together and take two different pictures in two locations. So that's why you have to draw the special features, whatever that might be. If you've ever seen office space, it'd be like a flare. So, and then you'll have two enterocytes. And again, use the enterocyte there. You will lay the drawings out as arranged in the example. And so what I did is, you can see how fast my internet is here, super fast. And so I arranged them like this. I took drawings from multiple semesters because I'm lazy and wanted to not have to redraw everything for the billionth time. Okay, and so take a picture. You guys are supposed to put your favorite book or something. Um, right here, book or movie, take a picture. It needs to be included in there as well, okay? And then, oh. okay, and then you will upload that before the due date, so make sure you do that. I put this disclaimer, we generally do this assignment for the final, except you have to hand them to me right before the final, 
maybe this will be better. I don't know what you guys think I just made this up on the fly to create busy work for you. Um, I do think it's actually valuable in terms of helping you learn how things get digested in the pig or the horse and the cow. So how non-ruminants and ruminants digest protein. And we'll do something pretty identical to this for lipids. Okay. And so there were a few questions when I initially posted it. Those are the people who looked at it. I don't know if anyone else has questions now about it, but now would be a great time to ask those questions. So when you say unique features, are you talking about like it has to be related to the course or you just want something to prove that it's ours? Yeah, so like what we did is this person did it not because I asked them to do, okay. but like she drew hats um, on them just to make it fun. I don't know why. And so <laughs> you can do that. You can do whatever you want, right? Okay. You can write a poem. You can, I don't care. Because that was the part my friends and I, we were talking about. We weren't sure if you wanted like different as in unique features as send a debt love class or did you want something silly? So silly is silly is better than related to class. We were all confused on. Yeah, silly is way better than related to class. But that makes sense. Thank class. you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Oh no. My internet connection's unstable. So can you still hear me? Sabrina? Yes, I have a question about the exam. So is the format still like the previous exam or are you going to be totally different? Uh, it's going to be different in the sense that the exam will be open book and open note. Um, basically what I'm going to do is post the exam on Sunday and you'll have all of Monday to do it. I'm going to try and make it take what I would believe to be 45 minutes. Um, there will not, I have not figured out a way to have you draw. Uh, yeah, I've not figured out a way to do that. Um, so it'll be multiple choice and short answer. So it'll be fairly similar to what it has been. So is that still like 50% of multiple choice, 50% of short answer? I haven't decided. Um, okay. Right now, it's easier for me to write short answer questions than it is for me to write multiple choice questions, but um, it will be more difficult for me to grade short answer than it will be for me to grade multiple choice. So I have to be careful because um, what I really want you to do, this would be how it'd be different, is I tried to make you think on the test that we took in class, um, but I really want you to think on these tests because um, there's no way you couldn't regurgitate. I could ask you a million multiple choice questions and given long enough, you could get them all right um, because you have all the information right in front of you. It would just depend on how long you wanted to spend on it. So um, I'm trying to be thoughtful about that. I don't want to make it hard and have to like give everybody hundreds right away because, um, but I want it to be challenging enough that there is, requires some thought and some separation occurs. Like I want all A's and B's basically. Okay, thank you. I've not been effective at today. For the exam three activity, does that just have to focus on the protein section or can we do like from previous sections like carbs and, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, so I would just focus on protein. There's a good chance that the, that the um, final exam activity will be doing the same activity, but for carbohydrates. Oh, okay. And what we normally do for the final exam is you do carbohydrates, protein, and lipids in one big package. And there's like 24 sheets of paper that you have to turn in. Yeah, and I so, thought that's what this was about, but it's just it is, protein. But it's just protein. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Just protein. So it's kind of trying to narrow it up a little bit so you don't have to do them all at once. Yes, Sabrina? Um, so for the, acti the exam three activity, can we just use the PDF to upload it? Do you want to owe the same package or the same? No, you can upload a PDF or a JPEG. It'll take either one. Okay. All right. You can just take a picture and hit upload. That's 
when I practiced it, that's the way it worked. We'll say that now. So I can just like write the pictures of, I mean, draw the pictures and scan them by the printer and fill us a PDF and upload it. Yes, but I want them all in one image. Oh, in one sense? image. Yeah, I'm sorry. So don't scan them in. Just take a picture of it with your phone and upload that picture. Oh, okay. The reason I want them all in one picture is because then I don't have to click on nine documents to grade it. I can okay. just zoom in and I can just zoom in and grade them fairly quickly. Okay, thank you. Okay, because there's 264 of them. So anything I do that takes more than a minute takes a long time fast. Devin? Oh. Okay, so in example um i know you said to look at that for like how to set it up but in the mm -hmm. example all three of the non-ruminant and all three of the ruminant pictures are kind of different are those just because they're different people's pictures or are we supposed to draw each one a little different than the other one no they're just different because like one is one i drew in class last semester the other i drew probably at a review and the other i probably drew for the internet Okay, but ours are all three are supposed to be the same, like minus can, the pictures? Yeah, they can be close to, I mean, yeah, they can be the same. Okay, okay. They That's all have the same information. I just draw the arrows in different um, spots. And like the middle one is probably the best one. Okay. That's the one right. of the cows I like. And the best one of the pig is this one because it's the most complete. But it just mm -hmm. needs to be complete. Like you would use this to study and you would feel like, yeah, I can do well. Or if I said, Draw protein digestion on an exam. This is what you would draw. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions on the activity? Okay. I hope it doesn't seem terrible, but McKinsey? Um, for the enterocyte, we still focus on protein for that one too, right? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. You're welcome. So, I don't know. Usually on the final exam, it's 40% of the final exam grade or 30%, depending on the semester. And so that's why I'm doing it now. It's just so you guys have, have the same experience and maybe this will be a better way to grade it. So I might do it this way from now on if it's better to grade it this way. Okay, anything else on this? Okay, so the thing, oh, Sabrina? Sorry, I have a lot of questions. Can we just go back to the quiz two again? Yeah. Let me think about how. I'm gonna have to stop sharing for a second. Okay. Uh, I'll share, I'll share this. You guys can't see the eCampus anymore, right? Right. No. Okay, that's good. Because I have to go to the grade center and now you can see everybody's grade. And that's like a violation of many laws. Okay, now you can see the quiz again? Yes. Okay, what did you want to know? Uh, I want to know the number four. So it's because a tripeptide is the, contained a, a three amino acid and sodium has three of them, so can lead nine of them. Is that what you're talking about? That's correct. Okay, uh, how about the Question two. So can you repeat why is A and C again? Is that because of the sodium related to? Yes, because they're both using sodium. 
And so you could like, there are three transporters on this option that use sodium, right? And you can't mm -hmm. pick SGLT1 because it just says products of protein digestion. Oh. And, and so that's why it's PEPT1 and sodium um, dependent and not SGLT1. SGLT1 uses sodium, right? Yes. So like what they might be on the final or even on the exam would be, I would list them all and it might not say protein. It might say which ones use sodium and then you could pick all three but not. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, for the question, yeah, for the question three. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you say that again? Why is the sodium de dependent transporter? Okay, so it's sodium dependent because it's going against their concentration gradient and it's only transporting individual amino acids, whereas PEPT1 transports Bipeptides and tripeptides, so not individual amino acids. AAT can only transport with the concentration gradient, and SGLT1 doesn't transport amino acids. Oh, um, so since the sodium uh, dependent transporter against can against the concentration gradient, is that need to use the energy or not? Well, it uses it indirectly. So if we go to I don't know how this works for you guys. It works better for me, but now you can see this too, right? You can see the peptide. So yeah, it's gonna diminish the sodium gradient um, when it's transporting amino acids in. This, the concentration of sodium will become higher in the cell when you're transporting amino acids in. So you'll have to use sodium potassium pump more to get it out. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, what else? Anybody have any general questions, things they want me to talk about, things they want to see? Can you go over a little bit about like the urea cycle and how like the ammonia turns into urea and it goes like back to the liver. I'm a little um, confused on that a little bit, if that makes okay. sense. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, it's my favorite topic on earth. So, okay, and this is like a mess, right? And so as you guys have drawn the cow, hopefully you've figured out how to make it make more sense. Okay, so uh, I need a pin. We'll get a blank one. So really there's three places that ammonia can come from. And the first place ammonia can come from is the rumen. And the second place it could potentially come from is the large intestine. Can you like blow up your screen bigger, please? Oh, uh, you want me? I'll just share this one. Yeah, that, thank I you. I forget not everybody has a massive monitor. Um, <laughs> The girls really like my monitor. They're like, that's really nice, Dan. Now you can see it, right? Yeah, we can see it now. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So we have ammonia in the rumen. We have ammonia in the large intestine. So one, two places. The third place is from the catabolism. Of amino acids. And so the catabolism of amino acids is just the breakdown of amino acids, okay? And there's really two times, maybe three times that's gonna happen. One is if you consume excess amino acids. And the other is, um, so you consume excess amino acids when you're breaking down protein, tissue protein. So say you're starving and you break down tissue protein 
Um, that would be another source of ammonia. And then just through the normal breakdown of amino acids over time, um, you would have uh, production of ammonia. So those are all sources from catabolism. All of this ammonia goes to the liver. Okay, and the reason that's important is because ammonia is toxic to the brain. Okay, so it all goes to liver. In the liver, you have this cycle, the urea cycle. And the urea cycle takes ammonia and makes urea. Okay, urea has two fates. The first fate is it can be excreted in the urine. And so um, then it's lost to the body, right? It's gone. The other fate is it can be recycled and it's recycled. What it's going to do is it's going to enter the gastrointestinal tract. And urea can do that via the blood into the rumen. It can also do it by moving from the blood into the saliva. And then the saliva is going to go to the rumen. The other place that's useful that it can go is the large intestine. Okay. And all of these things can happen in the ruminant and the non-ruminant with the exception of the rumen thing, but urea moves around everywhere. You have urea in your saliva, in your sweat, in your plasma, urea is everywhere, but it can enter the rumen or the large intestine. And then those two places, urease is going to produce ammonia. And so we have urease here as well. I shouldn't have drawn it right by the ammonia. That was stupid or silly, sorry. And so we have urea, or no, we have urease. And urease is an enzyme, so it's made of protein, right? And to NH3. And so those ammonia can be reabsorbed, or they can be used to synthesize MCP. And then the MCP can go down here and be absorbed and do all the good things that amino acids can do, okay? We can also use it to, in the large intestine, it can just be absorbed as ammonia, or it can be excreted as MCP. And we really like it to be excreted as MCP because nitrogen captured in protein is more stable, so it increases the value of the manure. So even in pigs, we really like this ammonia to be captured by the microbes and excreted as microbial crude protein. Same thing in horses, and in horses it's even kind of more important. Um, because they need nitrogen in their large intestine to provide nitrogen for microbes so the microbes can synthesize microbial amino acids and then peptides and then microbial crude protein. And those are the enzymes that allow the horse to digest or ferment structural carbohydrates in their large intestine. Okay, so basically it's an alternative source of nitrogen. Um, and it's most useful in the ruminant because it can provide microbial crude protein that the animal can digest. And so this is what, like, there's not very many things I know a lot about, but this would be the thing I know the most about. So we could talk about that a long time, but I'll pause and make sure that no one has questions about what we talked about, because this is probably about what you need to know. Mackenzie, do you have a question? I do. Okay. Um when we're talking about the ammonia that is coming from the urea and urease, like in the large intestine and in the rumen, yes. is that only coming from protein digestion or can it come from other things like carbohydrates and such? So urea, there's two ways the animal can get urea. You can feed the animal urea or it can enter via the blood. The urease is an enzyme and that enzyme is synthesized 
by microbes. So it's a bee, right? A microbial enzyme. And like urease is in the ground, urease is everywhere. Okay. Um, could that, because like carbohydrates, when we break them down, we produce ammonia. So could we take that ammonia and recycle it to the liver? So carbohydrates don't have ammonia. They don't have ammonia. Okay. Carbohydrates, right, they're just CH2O. There's no nitrogen in a carbohydrate. And so um, I think what you might be thinking about is when we feed carbohydrates, we need to provide nitrogen and we can take a carbon skeleton. So you can take a glucose, you can take a carbon skeleton or a carbohydrate and an ammonia and make an amino acid. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Sabrina. Oh, you went away. Uh, can you go over the metabolizable protein, the calculation okay. for that? Okay, so metabolizable protein. And so metabolizable protein equals the protein absorbable by the animal. Okay, so protein that the animal can absorb. We said that ruminants have two types of protein. They have UIP and they have DIP. If I fed a thousand grams of protein and it was 50% UIP, I have 500 grams of UIP and I have 500 grams of DIP. Are we good? And uh, sorry. Yep. Yep. For the video, you say it's like 60% and like 400 UIP and 600 DIP. Yeah, the numbers can change. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So we could, yeah, I could do that. I mean, I, I was just going to change them so they're different. But you want me to do the okay, same numbers? Gotcha. Okay. Oh, no, no, it's fine. Since the question is provided, it should be fine. Okay, so it just depends on what the diet is, right? You could have a 80% DIP, 20% UIP. So yes. I said that UIP is 80% digestible. And that number's wrong, but that's the number we use. On average, it's 80%. So that means they're going to absorb 400 grams of UIP. So 400 grams of amino acids are absorbed from UIP. Okay? So up here, we have 400 grams. The other source of metabolizable protein is MCP, okay? And we really need to know how much, um, how much carbohydrate or fermentable carbohydrate, fermentable organic matter. And so we're gonna say the fermentable organic matter was 3,000 grams, okay? And we said earlier, for every 1,000 grams, we basically produce 130 or 13%. So um, 3,000 times 13% would be 390 grams of MCP produced, okay? So we have 390, okay? And we put that up here, 400 plus 390 equals 790 grams of metabolizable protein. Okay, two questions. I have 500 grams of DIP, I only have, oh no, I did something, I skipped steps, guys. You should be really mad. That's why you should never do math on the fly. We're gonna take the 390 and we're gonna multiply it by 80% because it's only 80% true protein and it's only 80% digestible. 
And so that's multiplying 390 by 64, which is going to be hard to do in my head, but 400 times 64 would be two. We'll just do 390. Does someone have a calculator? Times 64%. Um, is 249.6. Yeah, so we'll just call that 250. Okay, and so we have 250 grams. So 250 up here, 400 plus 250 is 650 grams of metabolizable protein. Okay. What I was going to say before I realized how bad I messed up is we still had 390 grams of MCP. What happened to the 110 grams of DIP that didn't become MCP? Does anyone know? I can't even give you like guilty stares. So was it degraded by the ruminal microbes? The answer is yes, it was degraded by the ruminal microbes. Okay, if it was degraded by the ruminal microbes and not used to synthesize microbial crude protein, what happened to it is it was ammonia and that ammonia was absorbed out of the rumen and then excreted in the urine. Okay, if DIP isn't used to synthesize microbial crude protein, it gets excreted as ammonia, or it leaves the rumen as ammonia and gets excreted as urea, as urea in the urine. Okay, we'll do one more since I botched that up really bad. And so here we go. How much, I don't want, I'll do it. So we have a cow, the cow weighs a thousand pounds. And we feed our cow, or our cow eats two and a half percent of its body weight. Can you scoot your paper down a little? Hey, this is why I need you guys. Um, <laughs> so it eats two and a half percent of its body weight per day, which is 20, we'll feed it actually. 2.2% of its body weight per day. Which means it eats 22 pounds per day. Okay, and that 22 pounds conveniently is 10 kilos. that we're feeding them per day. That we're feeding our cow per day is 10 kilos per day. And if I say that 10 kilos is 10% crude protein, how many grams of protein is my cow consuming a day? She's consuming a thousand grams per day. And we're going to say that it is 30% UIP and 70% DIP. If you know one, you always know the other. So that means I get 300 grams of UIP and 700 grams of DIP. Okay, and what we're trying to figure out is MP supply. And so everybody should be able to figure out how much MP comes from UIP. To do that, we take our 300 and multiply it by 0.8 or 80% because that's it's 80% digestible. It means she's getting 240 grams of MP from UIP. 
Okay, we still have 700 grams of DIP hanging out. She's eating 10 kilos. If I say of that 10 kilos, 70% of it's digestible. Okay, and just for argument's sake, we're gonna pretend that's all in the rumen. So she's digesting 7,000 grams per day. And we said for every thousand, it's 13%. And so she will be making 700, 910 grams of MCP per day. Everybody cool with that? Everybody see where we got that? Anyone have a question? I do. So she's eating a thousand grams per day, but then she gets 7,000 grams. She's eating 10 kilos. Mm -hmm. The thousand grams is protein. Oh, okay. The rest is the rest. Does that make sense? That was a great question, Lauren. That was fantastic. Okay, thank you. That's why I don't teach math. Okay, are you good? Um, not yet. Uh, so what does 7,000 come from? 7,000 comes by taking 10 kilos or 10,000 grams and multiplying it by 0.7 because the diet's 70% digestible. Oh, okay. Good deal? Okay. So we have 910 grams of microbial crude protein that could potentially be synthesized. How many grams of DIP did I provide her? Someone needs to answer. I could like pick on you and unmute you. She has 700 grams of DIP, right? Right, very nice. So she has 700 grams. The microbes could synthesize 910 grams of microbial crude protein. Does anyone see a problem with that? That's too much for 700 grams. Yeah, 910 is greater than 700, right? And so what we could do is we could say one of two things. We could say um, she's going to meet this, and we could meet this through nitrogen recycling. So the recycling of urea will work, and so we're going to say she gets 910 grams of MCP. Okay, the other thing you could say is, well, she only has 700 grams, so we're gonna be short. And if we only have 700 grams, what do you expect to happen to carbohydrate digestion if we don't have enough DIP? What it's happens? gonna go down. Yeah, carbohydrate digestion is gonna decrease. So we have two options. When DIP is limiting, we can decrease carbohydrate digestion and we can increase nitrogen recycling when DIP is limiting. Those are the two options that can occur, okay? And we're not at the point where we can make that decision, so I don't care which you pick. You just have to say which you pick. So you can say, I decreased carbohydrate digestion because it's limiting. So in that case, MCP equals DIP, the amount of microbial crude protein that they produce is equal to the amount of DIP they consume, which is 700 grams. If you pick this case, MCP equals 910, 910 grams. So which one do you guys wanna pick? Nitrogen recycling. Okay. So we have MCP equals 910, and we multiply it by 0.8, because it's 0.8% true protein, 
multiply it by 0. 0.0 again because it's 80% digestible. So we take 910, multiply it by um, 0.64, we get 640 minus 64, which would be like... Um, 582. Very nice, thank you. 582 grams of MP. We add those two together to, to one, eight. 822 grams of MP. Everybody good? Okay, if my cow required, say she required 700 grams of MP, what happens to the 122 grams of MP in excess? I provide her excess amino acids. What happens to those amino acids? They would get broken into ammonia or and urea and excreted. Yes. So the amine group would become ammonia and the urea and get excreted, and the carbon skeleton would be used for energy. Fantastic. Okay, what else? Will we be doing a problem like this on our exam? That's a fantastic question, Savannah. Um, what do you think? Uh, yes. Do you think we should? Do you think? Oh, no, I don't prepare? think we should. <laughs> okay, does anyone think we should? <laughs> I do. Okay. Um, I'll make a special test for Sean. <laughs> his, will be, his will be math based. No, um, we're probably not going to do anything. We're not going to do math. Okay, okay cool. So, and we won't do like one for calculating crude protein either. Say that again. We won't be doing one calculating crude protein as well. Um, I'm not going to make that promise. Okay. Because you should be able to do that. But okay. I do think you should know. Like, those two things are really important. Okay. Sounds good. I have a question. Yes, Ms. Connor. Why is the CHO decreased? So the carbohydrate digestion is going to decrease. We're going to decrease carbohydrate digestion because the microbes don't, they can't make enzymes. Okay. If there's not enough microbial crude protein, they won't produce the enzymes to digest the carbohydrates. Thank you. Does that help? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, what else? You can already answer this, but the test be like the exam be timed? The exam will be timed in the sense that you pretty much have 24 plus 12, like 36 hours to complete it. So I don't know if that's timed or not. Okay. I mean, yeah, you'll have 36 or 48 hours to complete it. It won't be like you can, and yeah, once you open it, you can work on it. So no, it's not really timed. Is it going to be like one of those ones that when you open it, you can't reopen it if you close out of it? I don't know. Is that something? So some professors are doing that, but I would strongly warn against it because during my biology exam, my internet router literally turned itself off. Okay. So stuff like that happens, and a lot of my classmates have been like having internet issues where it they'll be kicked out of eCampus and everything. Okay. So I was just going so to you want me to make it so you don't have to complete it in one setting? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That would yeah. suck. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I think I can do that. Is everything else working okay? Anybody having problems with anything? 
feel like it must be going decent because the number of emails has gone way down this week. So, so you're that or you've given up. You said you were going to post another video maybe before this next exam. Have you done that yet maybe or are you going to? I post the train video. Did you watch the train video? Oh, no, I have not watched that yet. Yeah, I posted the train video. I don't know if it's any good, but it's posted. <laughs> okay. The train video is awesome. What, Madeline? <laughs> the train video is awesome. Okay, fantastic. You have to see my face, so if you want to avoid that, you might not. Uh, you might not should watch it. Don't watch it. Um, I have a quick question. So the microbial protein and yeah. the microbial crew protein is that different stuff? Same thing. The same thing. Okay. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Miss Connor, did you have a question? No, I was just gonna say that the video was helpful. Oh, the train video? Yes. Okay, good deal. Okay, anything else? I have no, I'm a, good. a question about, I guess it's more like a reiteration to make sure like I heard it right or like understanding it right. But for when DIP is limiting, it's whenever it is like lower than the amount of MCP that we calculated. And so that's when it's not like um, DIP is less than MCP, it's when MCP is greater than DIP, does that make sense? Yes, when MCP is greater than DIP, DIP is limiting. The thing about okay. DIP is, if I fed them a lot of DIP, they will degrade all of the DIP and it won't be synthesized in the MCP, like not all of it. So 100% of degradable intake protein is digestible. They're gonna, the microbes are gonna degrade it all. It might not be incorporated in microbial food protein. So it's easy for it to be in excess. If you run out of it though, the microbes will stop growing. So generally we feed excess DIP because it doesn't cost very much and it's better than having them run out. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, anything else? I'm planning on doing this next Thursday. Is that okay with everyone? Yes. Okay. Okay, and I'll record it too. And then the first exam, exam, I think is due on Monday the 13th. So if you have questions, it would be good to bring them on Thursday. Or you can email me. Okay, any other questions before we go? Okay, y'all have a good evening. Let me know if you have problems, concerns, things you need me to do, things to make it better and stay out of trouble. <laughs>